You are listening to The Catholic Wire. One day she knelt down in the, her little kitchen in Cuba and said, God, please help me. Tell me, how am I going to feed my kids? And there were uh, gunshots everywhere because Fidel Castro was taking over the city. My dad, they lost their jobs and my dad had to go to a work camp. Our apartment, we, my mom and dad bought it. That was all ours and they took all our property away from us. Everything. All of a sudden, I don't know what happened. I just went to church and I had never heard a rosary. So I started going to church. Back and she went around asking, who's that guy over there? And they said, I didn't see a guy. I didn't see anybody. It was St. Joseph. In the last decades, many Catholics have experienced terrible moral persecution. Their faith, their traditions, were taken away from the churches. Many have lived for many years ignorant of the deprivation they suffered. Some are still going through that painful and at once beautiful process of rediscovering the Catholic faith. For the encouragement of those still in that journey, faithful Catholics have shared with us their challenges trials, and blessings. This is the story of their journey, Back to the Faith. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Back to the Faith. You are listening to The Catholic Wire, and this is your host, Father Carlos Cepeda. Today I have a very special guest. She has asked to remain anonymous for obvious reasons, but she has a very interesting to story. I just met her today. I, I had never met her before, not personally anyways. But I'm very, very excited about today's show. Uh, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. So I would, I would love, as I had said before, the, the purpose of the show is to uh, kind of know the, the story of, you know, everyone and how they came to find the faith. What were the things that they lived in the Novus Ordo, you know, in the Vatican II Church that perhaps didn't seem right at the time. In your case, you have a very special, very interesting story in regards to your experience in Cuba, because you were born in Cuba. Oh yes, I, I was born in Cuba, and um, I grew up after co after communism. So co communism happened on January first, nineteen fifty nine. My sister was born on that day, actually. Wow! And there were uh, gunshots everywhere because Fidel Castro was taking over the city. And um, when I was born, after communism, what happened was is that um, my mom and dad had wonderful jobs in Cuba. My father was a train engineer, okay, and my mother was a school teacher. And she was back in the day, uh, she she got her bachelor's degree and she had a great job. But as soon as the government, communist government, knew, hey, we applied to leave the United to go to the United States, um, they fired my mother and father from their jobs and they had no um, income whatsoever. Wow. So when the what happened is when the communist government, and these are people who run the government, what Fidel Castro is, that he took the low, um, uneducated people, mm -hmm. the, and he gave them the high positions, and these people who ruled, uh, had, they were got, they're godless people. They don't believe in God. So when Fidel Castro took over, the first thing they did, they took the churches, the Catholic churches, mm -hmm. and they destroyed them. They took out all the statues, and they made it into a government press. So when you, there was, the Fidel Castro, he closed the churches for about five years or more. Mm -hmm. So my mom and dad could not um, get me baptized. They could, so I was baptized when I was five years old. Then he kind mm -hmm. of reopened the churches and, um, the, a lot of the churches were government presses. So every time you went after, uh, slowly, uh, they indoctrinized all the, the children in, in Cuba. When, when you say government presses, that means that they were, were they actually using that as a printing press? Yes, to, okay. to propaganda for okay. Fidel Castro and communism. The question just came to my mind right now. Did Fidel ever try to create like a national church of Cuba? You know, like make the priests like be subservient of the communist government. 
Because that has happened in almost every revolution. It happened that once they took power, they forbade the church, but then they said, okay, we're going to allow you to keep the churches, but the priests are going to have to swear to the government. They're going to have to be obedient to the government. And, and the government is actually going to appoint the priests. I don't know if you ever heard of anything like that there or no? Well, the, the priest, um, they weren't able to write information about the church or they weren't able to, they were very limited. Mm -hmm. So after they opened the churches, they weren't able to publicize information about the church. Everything was for Fidel Castro. Mm -hmm. I, equal to the schools. The schools, um, every you had to wear a uniform to when you went to the schools and they made you take an oath every morning about serving Fidel Castro. And so every picture in the school was the picture of Fidel Castro. And wow. um, and the schools, if you said anything against uh, the government, oh, they would probably uh, take your family, take you away from your family and put you into some type of reform camp or something. Mm -hmm. So like my mom, dad, when they said, I'm leaving the country, my dad, they lost their jobs and my dad had to go to a work camp uh, and caught sugar cane and mangoes and everything you had to do. So what happened is there's a government official in every every house block mm -hmm. has a house that is a military official and they go and they watch everything you do. They count, the military comes in, the government sends those people mm -hmm. who belong to the government who are communists and they count everything you have in your house. They count every utensil, every table, every everything. If you don't have that when you leave the country, like we, we signed up to go, we applied to go to the United States, mm -hmm. you can't leave the country. You have to have everything ready. For, so everything you have, like right now, everything you have belongs to the government. Every wow. single thing. And my mom and dad's wedding rings were taken from them. My first communion pictures were taken from us. So I have no pictures of my family. I have no pictures of, of my First Communion, nothing. Everything's, they took everything, the pictures, the rings, the clothes you have, mm -hmm. all your memories. The only thing I can tell you is that I wonder, how did my mom and dad, you know, because at that time, see, my mom, my dad wasn't Catholic, mm -hmm. and my mom um, was not Catholic either, but she would take us to church. She took my sister and, and I to church, to the mm -hmm. Catholic church. We did our first communion, but my mom had never done her first communion yet. She just went. Wow. She just had that kind of, you know, calling. And my dad said, did not believe in God at all. And so, um, when we got to the United States, you know, um, we have a friend who took us to the Latin Mass, mm -hmm. and um, I had never been to the Latin Mass. I didn't even go to the Novus Ordo. I I was just not practicing anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't know we were Presbyterians nope. before. Be oh, interesting. That's even more interesting. <laughs> Be before we go into that, uh, I want to mention something. You mentioned that your dad was working in cane fields. And most people probably don't know how hard that is. In Mexico, the, there's a mission where we have, we go through the cane fields and we see the people working in there. And I've done it. And basically what people do is you go with a machete, with a knife mm -hmm. on your hand, and you have to cut the canes. First, they burn them. Usually, I don't know if it's the same over there, but if it's a, a sugar cane, they'll burn the field. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go through the field cutting each cane with the knife, which is a, just cutting one takes several minutes. And if you're doing that with the knife, your hands are bleeding pretty oh, soon. Yeah. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. That's a slave labor, really. So that just to give a, people a, a perspective of what that really means. Uh, so how was it your... You're going out of Cuba. How did that happen? Well, my dad didn't want to leave the country. He was terrified because he was already 45 years old. And he already, mm. you know, but my mom said, no, we got, we have to leave because there's nothing to eat. The kids have nothing to eat. Um, the government is just um, always in, intruding in our affairs. And you have no freedom whatsoever. You have no freedom of, you can't say anything against the government because Mm -hmm. They'll kill you right there, take your family or your kids from you. Mm -hmm. The the human rights violations, you know, um, you just have no freedom whatsoever. Uh, everything is military, military and anger and hatred, everything. If you're not part of the military, we're going we're gonna to come after you, you know. So mm -hmm. my mom said, uh, we're going to apply to go 
to the United States, and it's a, a great process because as soon as you apply, they fire you. You lose your job. You're gone. You don't have a way to to put money to put money um, to put food on the table because you don't have money. Mm-hmm. And so what my mom did is she had to do like my mom was a school teacher, but she lost her job then, and my dad lost his job as a train engineer. So she started doing nails, selling things that um, like. Um, Earrings. She would make. She would take like the beach balls that are plastic and she, vinyl, and she would cut those up and make little earrings out of it. And that's what how she made her money, mm-hmm. and sold to get. Uh, there's although there's no food. So what? How much can you buy? You really. It's not like the United States where you go to Walmart, or you go to Baker's, and there's food on the shelves. When you mm-hmm. go to Cuba, everything is empty. All the shelves is. And are empty. All you're going to see are mice and rats running around and cockroaches, wow. because what they do, the government, um, they ration food to control everybody. They ration everything. So what do you get? You get a card that says that you can only have a month, every month, um, two pounds of rice and a pound of two pounds of beans, and that's your quota for the whole month. Wow. After you st- stand in line, you stand in line in the humid heat because it's a tropical island for three or four hours and people are cutting in front of you and you just have to put up with everything Mm -hmm. so what happens is that um once you get to the end of the line to the counter like imagine uh here's your pound of rice and beans or maybe if they're out of it because there's no more Mm -hmm. then you're out of luck you have nothing to eat for the whole month what do you do so they came, uh, the Cuban uh, communist people who love communism, of course, they get the best of everything, but the people mm-hmm. don't get anything. So they said, oh, just take the bananas or the plantains, boil them, and ground them up, the the, the outside of them, the, the skin of them, the peels, mm-hmm. and grind them up, and that would be your meat. That's your ground beef. Wow. That's what they said to do. The, I had a... A friend when I was in college who was in Cuba, mm-hmm. and and he well, he would get very upset because sometimes people we had obviously students that were pro communism, and they would be saying, "Oh, it's so great!" And you know, this is how it should be. The guys with the shirt of Che Guevara <laughs> and everything, he would get like enraged, like very very you know, there is a word for that, incensed. He would say like, "You have no idea what you're talking about." Like he would actually call them names because it's like. He said that. He said I mean, you would go on a line and it's like you get rice and beans yeah. and you can't do anything about it. And and someone mentioned to me that, I mean, you would get like people would try to smuggle food, you know, like a pork or, mm-hmm. or you know, like a pig, I, I a should pig, say. A pig, right. But if you get caught with that, you would get killed or, or yeah. something like that. I mean, They I would know. just behead you, you know. This mm-hmm. is what happens. So my mom and dad, since we, like I said, you get to the end of, you get to the counter. Mm-hmm. And there's, imagine, there's nothing. It's like, let's say you go to Baker's or Walmart and there's nothing on the shelves, nothing. Just cockroaches running around it. In Cuba, you, ha- you actually have flying cockroaches. Yeah. They have wings, and the wings work. <laughs> In Mexico, too. <laughs> <laughs> and you're eating, whoa, and a big cockroach lands there. But you're not eating much because there's nothing to eat, right? Mm-hmm. So this is what happened. My mom would get to the end of the line, and I would line up with her in the hot sun. Because the government wants to control you through the food. Mm-hmm. Here's a little bit of food. I'm so good to you. I'm going to give you just a pound of rice, you know. The mm-hmm. rest... And I'm I'm so kind. They, they they want you to to depend on them for yeah. everything. Don't depend on God. Depend on me. On them. That's what they're saying, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when you get to the end of the line and you get your your little bit of rice, it's got bugs in it. You have to go home and rinse it off. Or if you get if you're lucky enough to get a loaf of bread, it's full of ants. Put it in the oven. Get rid of the ants, right? Mm-hmm. So the food they give you is. Uh, ins- infest- infested with insects. Mm-hmm. Um, so my mom and dad, what they did is they took. We lived in like a little apartment, right? Mm-hmm. And they took a pig. They bought a pig from the farm because my mom and dad had to say they knew where they were living in the country. So they had a stash of money underneath um, this stair- little stairway we had, and they would go in there and, and count their money because they were, you know, running short on it. Yeah. So they would go in there and count their money and and they took that part of that money and bought a pig they went to a farm and so everything's done how do you say it clandestine 
Yeah, uh, under under underground, I yeah, guess. Yeah, like the mm -hmm. underground. The, the black market for pigs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah. So they would go buy the. Uh, they bought the pig. They brought it home. But like I said, there's someone watching you. Everything you do. Look, back then, they didn't have cameras or anything. Thank God, because then they would know you're bringing the pig in, right? Mm -hmm. But the person who is in that house that belongs to the, their government officials. They were watch everything you do. So my mom and dad waited till it was dusk, nighttime, right? Mm -hmm. They waited till the sun went down and covered up the pig and walked it. My dad parked the car very close to the door and walked it in the in the house. And they placed it in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was like my pit pig, I, my little <laughs> pig pet, you know. And of course, I was only eight like eight, seven years old and I was in love with the pig you know so I would mm -hmm. give it food and um, and that was our extra food for the whole month or over the whole month and we had to share mm -hmm. that with our other family members yeah so it was quite um, you know quite interesting and, and at the same time it was very when you're a child you see all these things and so my dad you know took they took the pig it was the day to kill the pig so that we could have food. And I remember my dad uh, killed the pig with my uncle, Panchin. Mm -hmm. He was actually half Mexican, but he lived in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So they took, um, they cut, they, they, they uh, took the pig and then they... Uh, Slit the throat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and well, Cubans collect the blood of the pig yeah. and they make, we make this awesome um, thing. It's almost like liver. It's got garlic and all spices and you put that in bread and you eat that. And uh, you know, and nothing is wasted. So, especially then, it's like yeah, you, know, you, you wouldn't then. waste Ex anything. Exactly, they had to take the pig and and they they took the skin off. They had to take hot water and, and clean the pig and the skin off and then um, and the hairs off and stuff. And then they take the pig and they roast it. They roast it and roast it for hours, and uh, that's how you get food in Cuba. We will take a short break and we'll be back for more. You're listening to the Catholic Wire. In the Catholic Wire, we have pledged to provide our online content free of charge in order to benefit as many souls as possible. If you wish to contribute to the support of our network, please go to our website to provide a donation. All your contributions will be used exclusively for the propagation of the Catholic faith. Welcome back to Back to the Faith. We continue to listen to the story of our guest as she tells us how they departed from Cuba. It's so hard to just get to church because the kids are so indoc indoctrinized that in Cuba you have Saturday school. So you go to school mm -hmm. all day, even Saturday. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they, the kids, they indoctrinize the children where they tell on the parents. Let's say the parents are saying, oh, I want to you know, overthrow the government or I want to do something to to um, have more food, anything the kids know that is against those thoughts of the government, they indoctrinize the children to go and tell them the parents. Wow. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see that happening? Like, uh, did you actually see one of the children, like, accusing his parents or, like, near to you or? No, I, I never saw that. But my mom always said, and my, my mom always said, Shh, don't say anything at school. Don't say we're leaving. Mm. Don't say anything. So they really put the, f the fear in you. Your parents say, hey, be careful. Don't say anything. But, you know, kids mm -hmm. do talk. They're That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Know. I was going to say that. I mean, for a child, maybe you don't realize just how serious things are. But right, for parents, know. I can't imagine how difficult it must have been for them mm -hmm. to deal with that, you know, being taken away from everything and, and having to deal with that. You can imagine, you know, being a oh, mom now. Yes. The stress that you would go through if you had to deal with that situation is... Bless my mom. She was yeah. so good. So she, she said one day she knelt down in the, her little kitchen in Cuba and said, God, please help me. Tell me, how am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to get out of this situation? Because mm -hmm. the, although we applied, it took years to be able... We were one of the last ones to leave. We left in 1971. And wow. we were like one of the last ones to leave because they were going to close... Even if you have an apl application, there's no human rights. The government doesn't care. The communist government doesn't care. They'll do whatever they want to to you and your family. Mm -hmm. You're their property. That's how, the way they look at it. Uh -huh. And they're not they're not merciful at all. They they hate you. They hate you. They have hate, mm -hmm. and and they just want to you know pretty much they want to just 
destroy the family, you know. And so my poor mom um, said, oh, you know, my God, how am I going to do, what am I going to do here? And and so she knelt down, and at our house, even if my mom and dad weren't practicing Catholics, mm -hmm. we always had the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a picture. My mom had a picture mm -hmm. of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and I remember looking at the picture and, and thinking, who is that? This beautiful <laughs> picture of um, our Lord of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know what you know what it was back then. You just stare at the picture, but I think the grace came. I think from the picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. We have relatives in New York. We have they. He's married my my mom's cousin. He's Cuban, but he's married to an American. He when he came in the '60s, he married her, and he was the one who claimed us. You could only be claimed by family. Mm -hmm. So he got us out of the country, and when. Um, but but in Cuba, there's just so much suffering that went on. I can't even tell you how much suffering there was. I was always in fear, you know. I, mm -hmm. I was always afraid. When I went to the school, We, uh, I was always afraid that something was going to happen to my family, my mom and dad. I, I was terrified, always. Mm -hmm. um, because the government, like I said, the, the government, they always spy on you, and they come in your house at any time of night or day. Mm -hmm. They can come in and take anything they want. So my dad's property, my, his car, my mom, our house, you know, that was our, our, our apartment. We, my mom and dad bought it. That was all ours, and they took all our property away from us, everything. So property is the government's. Mm -hmm. um, the kids, scary enough, the kids are the government's property. They can take this, your family apart and take the kids whenever they want to. They just go in there, take it, no question, because there's no, no human rights. Mm. Everything belongs to the government, everything. Mm. And so what Fidel Castro is like, you were asking previously about a religion. What he did is he created this kind of brujeria. It's a witchcraft thing where they they practice in Cuba because the African who came in Cuba made their own religion mixed with the Catholic, and it's called mm. brujeria. But that's what's... Santeria? Santeria. That's mm -hmm. what's in the island now. Mm. That's very prominent, and that's what he allowed and wanted, you know, let... Um, let the Cubans have that that horrible wow yeah it's very popular now actually it's in all of South America and Mexico actually oh, it's going in Mexico really yeah. oh okay it's yeah. going a lot in there that's interesting yeah I didn't know that so I remember that in Cuba um, you know I would ask my mom what what happened to the to the church here although my mom wasn't a practicing Catholic because she had never done her first communion her mom never got her to do her first communion mm -hmm. and I was, they weren't practicing I was going to mention that that before you get the revolution going Usually, what happens is that they have to de-Christianize the people. And that's how it always goes. You know, it's like they start taking away religious instruction. They start taking, they start uh, putting, taking away the morals of society, you know, by any kind of means. And then once the society is without morals and, and, and without religious education, they're ready to bring the revolution. That's how it happened in France. That's what happened in Mexico as well. And for what you're saying, that's what happened in Cuba. You know, like people are still Catholic because they, they their parents were Catholic, right? But right. they have they have been lacking religious instruction, or, or they have been, you know, living in immorality, things like that, and and that's mm -hmm. what gets people ready to bring the revolution. That's in very there. interesting. I didn't even realize that, but yeah, yeah that's true. Enough. Because like I said, my grandmother, you know, my mom didn't do her first communion or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So you're right. The preparation was there. Yeah. to take the the i the the good ideas out of of the people and because my like i said my dad wasn't a practicing he didn't even believe in god you know nothing mm -hmm. and um how how was the the living did you guys did you live in a plane or boat or what we left in an airplane because my my uh, claimed us and then we went to New, to New York in an airplane, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then my mom and dad, my dad was 45, he didn't speak English. My mother didn't speak that much English, just a little bit. And my dad, my mom was in her, I think my mom was like 35, and my dad was 45. They're like kind of 10 or 11 years apart. Mm -hmm. So when we got to New York, they, they didn't speak English, and they had to work in a factory. We got there when it was snowing, January oh, wow. 6th, which is the Cuban um, Christmas is January 6th. Yeah, yeah. 1971 that's when we got there and my mom and um my mom and dad didn't speak english but we didn't have welfare or anything like that because the government said if you claim someone told my family 
then you don't then you can't they can't apply for welfare so they didn't so my mom and dad got a factory job in the snow they had to walk um in queens new, in new york they walked to work and my mom and dad since they didn't speak english all they could do was sweep uh, wow. in the factory it was a factory of making like um metal stuff you know like things you put on the refrigerator those magnetic little things that they used to make back in the 70s mm -hmm. and so my mom and dad had a very very hard life in, in Cuba they had a good life but then once communism came you know so I when we got to the United States we became um, my aunt in New York um, they're Protestants you know so we became uh, Baptist over there for a okay. while and then we got then my other aunt my mom's um, aunt um, said hey come to California so we went to California mm -hmm. uh, a year later my mom and dad saved enough money to be able to move from New York. They got to California, uh, and then which um, must have been really nice going to oh, New York in the cold great. to California. <laughs> it was so nice because you know cold weather. I got sick yeah, because <laughs> why, why did I got I got like some type of flu, and I couldn't breathe because mm. uh, I was only like eight years old when I was in New York, right? And my mom and dad had to take all their savings to pay a house called doctor so that I could get the medicine to get better. So all their hard work on their savings where they were working in the factory, they would go from, you know, walking to the factory from the house in the snow. And mm -hmm. we had never seen snow because Cuba's a tropical island. It's yeah. like Hawaii, like living in Hawaii. Yeah. And uh, my poor mom and dad had to pay the doctor all their money to get me to get me better. And then and finally they used part of that money to go to to go to um, California and that was very nice because California is warm and mm -hmm. we stayed with my aunt for a while and then we we went to the to the church of my aunt which was you know a Presbyterian church you Presbyterian know? Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and we did uh, Kumbaya my lord we sang and all the phrases and stuff you know I learned a lot of Sunday school I went to Sunday school and um, mm -hmm. then for years passed and when I was a teenager you know, my mom and dad never went to really back to church or the Presbyterian. We didn't go to church on Sundays or anything. Mm -hmm. No religion, you know. We did say like maybe if I I just didn't know how to pray. I didn't know I didn't know the rosary. Mm -hmm. It's what what they call I was some people call it liberal Protestant. You know, yeah, like y yeah. you believe vaguely in Christ, but you really don't go to mass on right. or church on Sundays or anything like that. Yeah, well, my mom was a deacon in the Presbyterian church. Wow. And she would take me to cut the bread and make the wine and put the wine on each of the pews and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then after that, we never went back anymore. And it, it was years before any, any you know, type of religious stuff, you know. So my mom, uh, so then I had a, a Cuban friend from Florida. And my Cuban friend and I, we were buddies from high school. We grew up together. Um, this This guy... He comes from Florida and he said, hey, it was her friend, not mine, mm -hmm. let's go to church, okay? And mm -hmm. it was the Latin Mass, right? It was a, an independent priest, Father Donahue, an independent priest, right? Okay. So um, he takes us to church, right? And uh, I had never heard the rosary or, or seen a Mass ever, you know? Mm -hmm. After Cuba, I never saw any of that. And so my friend and I were laughing we're saying, look at the rosary, they're praying, there. what is that? And we would like elbow each other, uh -huh. and she would pinch me, and I would pinch her, and we were laughing. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is this? You know, why did you bring me? Are you crazy? Yeah. And then um, I saw all the vestments with all the glitter and stuff, and we just we just thought it was weird. Mm -hmm. So I never, you know, I never really wanted to go back or anything. And um, all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. I just went to church. And I had never heard a rosary, so I started going to church. Mm -hmm. And my mom and dad didn't want me to go. They said, what are you doing? Come on, we're going today. We're going to Magic Mountain. We we're going with your cousins. Why? And I said, no, I have to go to church. And they were so mad at me. They wanted me to go to Magic Mountain, not to church. Mm -hmm. But so I just started going to church all the time and praying and praying. And then I learned how to say the rosary. And then I taught mm -hmm. it to my mom. And my mom and I then started praying the rosary. Wow. Yeah, uh, and and then we got we I got a green scapular, mm -hmm. and you know it said um, Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us now at the hour of death, and um, Immaculate Mary conceived without sin, pray for us. So I take this green scapular and I put it like in my dad's room because I wanted him to convert mm -hmm. so much. I prayed so much for him to convert, you know. Mm -hmm. So guess what I got him? You'll never guess what I got him. I got him a uh, a chain. 
uh-huh. with a miraculous medal. Okay. Yeah, and I got it blessed. And I said, Dad, wear this. Don't take it off. So he, he would wear it, you know. And then I got my scapular, brown scapular. Come on, Dad, wear this, you know. Uh-huh. And my mom was, um, she was wearing her st- her brown scapular. She was, and she was, uh, my poor mom, she would say the rosary and stuff. And then she uh, told, th- told him, I had never done my first communion. I want to do my first communion. And mm. the priest there, she did her first communion. Wow. Know? How yeah. old was she when she did it? She must have been like maybe late 50s, maybe. Wow, yeah, that's yeah, quite amazing. Yeah, yeah well, quite amazing. And she, she was just a wonderful lady, you know. And so then her mom came from Cuba, and her mom had <clears throat> never done her first communion. Mm-hmm. But we called the priest. Um, she had Alzheimer's. She got Alzheimer's, and she was bedbound in the fetal position. Mm-hmm. So my poor uh, grandma, my mom, you know, she got her last rites, but she couldn't go to communion or confession because she had never done done mm-hmm. her first communion or confession. But I wish, I, I mean, oh, I wish she would have gone, but she was already had Alzheimer's, so she couldn't yeah. go. She probably but, couldn't yeah, hold it in either. Rational, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but my mom... My mom was a great lady. She went to Cuba and she went back to Cuba and got her family all like um, rosaries and scapulars and stuff. And, you know, wow. and they all start like praying. And um, she was a wonderful lady. And she brought them food and all sorts of mo- and money, too, because they needed money to live, you know, for mm-hmm. money, for food. They didn't have money for food or anything because communists, mm-hmm. it got the communism progressed to getting worse it's it's even worse now mm-hmm. um there's no resources nothing everything's collapsing in cuba people don't have food it's desperation you mm-hmm. know it's just desperation um and it's a godless society unfortunately it is you know it's just godless um so my my mom back to america then my mom got um my mom was already did her first uh communion and stuff and we were going to church all but like we even went to like first friday all the time we went we were you know pretty pretty religious i could say i guess you could say that and we prayed a lot you know i don't think we were more religious than parents who have been always very very you know religious Mm -hmm. but and so i um my my um my dad you know slowly after i after i got married and I was so sick. Every time I had, I was expecting a baby, I would get sick, and I would like throw up almost the whole nine months getting so wow. sick. I would lose weight, not gain weight. I'll show you a picture. I looked like a skeleton. So I would offer all the suffering up for my dad. Oh, dad, come on, let's go. But before six months before he died, no, mm-hmm. three months before he died, um, he went and he died in. He was seventy-one. He went. He um, got married by the church. Mm. He had never been married by the church. He got married by the, uh, you know, Catholic Church, and mm-hmm. then he had um, he, and he um, went to confession. But he didn't get to go to communion because Father Pazad from the Saint Pius the Tenth they were going to give him the, you know, the instructions. But he never got to that point. He had a massive heart attack and he died. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but at least he he, he converted. Knew, he converted right. He converted wow. right. And then um, my poor mom, you know, she really did a great job going to Cuba and, and getting the, all the scapulars out to her family and the rosary and stuff and mm-hmm. told them this is how you pray, you know, and wow. she was just great. We will take a short break and we'll be back for more. You're listening to The Catholic Wire. In The Catholic Wire, we greatly appreciate your questions and stories, and we would like to feature them on the air. If you have anything you would like to share, please send it as a voice message, and we may select it to appear in our podcast. If you had to, if, if, if you think about it, do you see any parallels between what's going on right now in the world, you know, in several countries, and what you saw in Cuba? Oh yeah, there's a lot. The uh, socialism, the, uh, the government wants to just take over families, you know, they want to indoctrinize kids. It's just like what happened in Cuba right now. There are parallels that I see in, first in the media, you know, like in news and stuff. Oh, yeah. Like you notice how censorship, a lot of censorship, you know, like you can't, you can't bring the other point of view, you have to stick to the one, you know, 
narrative of the yeah. government. Um, do you see that too? Yeah, I see that too. And and in Cuba, if you said anything, like censorship is like the government owns the press. Yeah. They take apart the Catholic Church, all the statues, everything, and it's a government press now. And you can't, you can't write, you can't say write your own opinion. You can't do anything. And you can't say, oh, this is my opinion. It counts. No, it's all what the government wants you to believe, mm -hmm. and it, it's on uh, <coughs> propaganda. Yeah. The other one is schools. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that I've seen too. That they they go after schools. They go after the teenagers, the children, and, and in Mexico, it's Mexico has been. Uh, communist pretty much so for a long time is not properly communist like Cuba like it didn't go that far yeah. perhaps mm -hmm. uh, thankfully but uh, but definitely the party that was in power was at least socialist or com mm -hmm. communist tendencies and one of the things one of the first things they did was forbid for they forbade all Catholic schools all private schools and mm -hmm. the only schools that you had available was the, go the schools from the government And then the and that's something a lot of people in America don't know. Uh, if you have a school in Mexico and you want to have a private school, you can, but it cannot have anything religious in there. You can have a homosexual teacher if you want to, but you cannot have a priest. That's forbidden, like oh, super forbidden. No, I have no idea. And then you have to use a program of the government. You cannot use your your own program, your own books or whatever. You can add stuff to it if you want under the water, you know, under the table. Mm -hmm. But you have to follow the program of the government, which is, of course, communist and, you know, it's all indoctrination and false history all over the place. When I went to, I went to public school all my life in Mexico. And when I joined the monastery in Mexico and I started studying history from other books, not the government books, I was like, what? You know, it's like everything is backwards. It's like totally different of what I, for example, they, one of the things... They all speak about the French Revolution as the greatest thing on earth and, you know, the liberties of man and the rights of man and all those things. And when you study what happened in the French Revolution, it's like, whoa, this is totally backwards. Uh, so I noticed that, another parallel. And, and another parallel, and I don't know if you have noticed that one, is immorality. Mm -hmm. You know, that they foster immorality. And I don't know if you know from Cuba... I. I The impression I have from what I've heard is that in Cuba they fostered a lot, you said, santeria, but also prostitution and that kind of oh. stuff, like immorality in that regards. Very much so. It's so immoral. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean... People not marrying anymore. No, just living together. That's how, that's how Cuba is right now. And if, if you want to just... I, I remember in Cuba there was a case that this girl um, was... Ex got pregnant so she goes to the forest there to the camp where they work they're mm -hmm. working because all the students they are expected all summer long summer's not for you for the students anymore you have to go to a work camp mm -hmm. so when you're a student in Cuba you have school and you have Saturday school but on the summer summertime you go to the to the I was going to say it's like a concentration camp <laughs> It, it is. It is. <laughs> it is <right>? yeah. <laughs> you go to the camp and you work for free for the government. So this girl got pregnant and she went and had the baby and just killed it there. So mm -hmm. there's no respect for life. It's so immoral and immorality. It's um, just there's no no structure whatsoever of you're not a human being anymore. You're an animal. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? It's like um, evolution is we're we're going backwards. We have no. No good music to listen to, uh, no mm -hmm. classical music, everything's just work, work, work mm -hmm. for the government. Work, 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 and we tell you what to do and how to think and, and what you can't do anything out of that circle, that, that square they put you in. Yeah. I might cut this, but there's a priest that from Russia, and he would say this joke. He would say that one time Fidel Castro was going out to the cup, you know, people out there, and he was saying... There was a problem because people like to dance a lot. Oh, Cubans. Yes. Yeah, yes. So, so he would say like, this is not, this is, we're about work here. We don't <laughs> dance. We're all about work. No more dancing. So I want you to all to repeat. No more dancing. How was it? Work. Yes. Dancing. No. And the people go, work. Yes. Dancing. No. Work. Yes. Dancing. No. Work. Yes. Dancing. No. And then they start, work. Yes. 
dancing. <laughs> no, <laughs> they start dancing. They start dancing. <laughs> but you have to see this, this, you know, this person from communist country also going like with the joke, and he starts dancing. It's just, it's so real. It's so funny, that's, but it's very true. That, that's true. Cubans dance a lot. They love dancing. They'll turn everything into music and dancing, and yeah, you know. That's another thing too. You know, in Mexico, the government would appeal to the lower stratus of the society and this is not it's not that we're you know saying that there's a higher value or anything but it's true that more educated people have more of a possibility of thinking you know and right. and, and and actually reasoning and saying no what they're saying to to me here is a lie and i won't follow that but the communists and and especially in mexico i've seen it happen a lot where they'll they'll aim at the lower stratus you know the people that are poor the people that are uneducated and they'll give them bread and yeah bread and games because you know. you're so hungry see that mm -hmm. they control you with food you're so desperate and hungry mm -hmm. when you're hungry you're not acting rational you're like an animal i'm hungry i got it that's number one i gotta eat right yeah. so what they do is they control the food yeah and you are not rational when you're hungry so how do they control you? They give you a little bit of food. Come and get more. I'll give you like a little, like a, here, a little bit of, follow me, follow this path. Here's mm -hmm. more food. Here's yeah. more food. And they drag you into that system they want. Now, I want, there's a question. I, I don't want to take a lot of your time here, but there's three questions I ask to all my guests in this show. And the first one is, if you had to think of all that you had to go through to find the true faith and, and to find God, what do you think was the hardest thing, the, the biggest challenge, like the most difficult thing on, on that journey to find the true religion? Uh, it's a very difficult and because people don't li don't like Catholics anymore, like true Catholics. Mm -hmm. the, the people from the Archdiocese, they don't like you. I had a job at the Archdiocese and they, as soon as they know you're a traditional, you're out, you're out, and I was out. You don't have friends because no one... How many people do you know are traditional? Not that many. No one wants you, mm -hmm. so they want they. You're like an outskirt. You're like an outsider, mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. Even my friends, you're an outsider. I don't have any friends, because no one wants to practice the faith. They think, oh, you're crazy. What? Why are you going through all that? And uh, it's very hard to nowadays, you know, to live the faith because uh, usually you have a like a lot of you have a lot of uh, bills with a lot of you know, you have a lot of kids to feed and stuff, and that becomes very difficult because you, you know, you get in debt doing that. Mm -hmm. And people, you go to a job, and people just don't want to be your friends. They don't. As soon as they see that you're Catholic or wearing a scapular, or you, I dropped so many rosaries from my pocket. <laughs> it's like <laughs> they don't want anything to have to do with you. They don't like Catholic people. You know, they don't like, but traditional Catholic people, they don't want to be part of it. Like I said, my friend and I went to the same church. We got the same prayed the same prayers and she um she never went back mm -hmm. um, i'm the I, st I, st I stuck it out and i you know stuck it out and i kept on mm -hmm. saying prayers but it's a very difficult life it's not a life of like luxury it's just a hardship life all the time it's a little bit of a persecution not a little bit it's actually a real moral yeah. persecution but something that comes to my mind and and i thought about this before you see the parallel with communism too Mm -hmm. where you have a system that takes over and they demonize the opposition, so to speak, and you have to live with hardships if you want to live free yeah. and according to the truth. Right. You know? right. But uh, it is a persecution for sure. But the good, the good side about that is that there is a lot more merit because now, you know, before many people were Catholic because of it was a custom. You know, my dad was Catholic. Right, my grandmother right. was Catholic. Mm -hmm. Now if you're Catholic... A true Catholic is like you're making the choice mm -hmm. and it's like you're doing it for God like you know for sure that you would not be doing this you would not be going through this if it wasn't because you really want to be there with God mm -hmm. and that to me is right. something very valuable like every Catholic right now most Catholics that are Catholics and that persevere as you say it in the face in the faith are people that are doing this solely and purely for God there is no other reason the same the, I don't want to you know throw praise on us but the same thing goes for priests and, and sisters and religious it's like before being a priest it was like okay i'm gonna make a living and you know i'm mm -hmm. gonna be this big priest in this big church you know with this a lot of people and or sisters 
And now people that follow their religious vocation or priestly vocation, yeah. they're doing it just for God. There's nothing else there that is saving your soul, of course, but it's mostly for God. And the same thing goes for all Catholics. It's it's difficult, but it's inspiring mm -hmm. to see that, that. And that's something very nice about this show that I've been doing, that I talk to people and it's like, wow, it's really exciting, really encouraging. That's the second question. The second question goes, what do you think is the greatest blessing that you have had? You know, the, the most beautiful thing, the one that you are more thankful for I, in this journey. I'm just, well, I'm thankful, you know, for knowing the faith because it's a truth. I'm thankful for, like, um, our families and um, that we we try to practice the faith and uh, we know the, the true value of the Mass and... Um, we don't have, like I said, I don't have a lot of friends and I don't have a lot of, um, you know, people. Usually it's like they push you away from that circle, you know, because mm -hmm. you're humble and you want to serve God and they don't want to. They just want to, they push you away from that uh, circle. And the greatest thing is the kids, you know, my kids. And I'm thankful for our family, like our families. Like I said, my mom and my dad converted, and I never thought that would happen. I never thought my mom and dad were going to convert mm -hmm. because they didn't know the faith, you know, and um, they had no idea of the sacrament until we started going and saying the rosary and going to church, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just incredible that I'm so thankful that my poor mom could have done her first communion and she came mm -hmm. up. She just... And, th and then after that, I'll tell you a story. Um, I know you don't have much time. But no, I'll no, please you. do. That's what we're doing this for. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. Well, so after my mom did her first communion, mm -hmm. and she was, you know, late. It was like 50s or whatever. She was late in her life, right? Mm -hmm. And um, she was very uh, pious. She always prayed, prayed the rosary, prayed so much. And um, so she had a job as uh, they made those plastic cups, you know. She had this job, and it was a hard job. She got the supervisor job, but um, then another lady who wanted that position was giving her a very hard time mm -hmm. and trying to get her fired, right? So my mom said, this novena I have to St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. And she prayed to St. Joseph, please help me, St. Joseph, with the job. You know, I have a family to feed. I need your help. And she said that over by three rows down or four uh, quite a distance you know four rows down where those it's a it's a, an industry where they make these cups right mm -hmm. and she said there was a man there with a beard and hair and long kind of long hair mm -hmm. and he had like little pieces of wooden pebbles on his face like when you you know when you carp you're a carpenter and you and mm -hmm. you get little pieces of um, yeah. wood on your face and on your hair and she went out, and then she he said hi to her, and she said hi back, and she went around asking, who's that guy over there? And they said, I didn't see a guy. I didn't see anybody. It was St. Joseph appeared wow. to her. Yeah, St. Joseph appeared to her, and her job took off, and mm -hmm. she was able to pay off her house and make a lot of money after that, you know? That she true. had a lot of difficulties, and, you know, and then after she said that prayer to St. Joseph, she said everything just kind of fell into place and her job took off you know and she was fine mm -hmm. and um she was in, it's incredible you know i'm just so thankful that my parents were able to know the faith and that's really beautiful yeah i mean that's a beautiful story beautiful story the the third question that i have and this is very important too is what advice would you give to the young generations of catholics as i was as i always mention in the show the young generations are sometimes not aware of the struggle that their parents had to go through or or even for example what you live through communism they are not aware of all those things you know for them it's like i was grown here in america or in another country where things are going fine things are given easily for me and my mother brought me here to church but they kind of never realize what it is like to be without the church and what it is like to actually have to go through that process of finding the true church, the true faith. So what advice would you give to those generations of young Catholics, of, of young people that are uh, experiencing that? I, I'd say um, uh, you have to keep your faith, keep on reading and going to the sacraments, to confession and, you know, communion and 
wear your scapular and say your rosary and because they're gonna um and done they're what they're doing is they're breaking up society to the point especially in the schools to the point where um you just don't value any of these uh, wonderful sacraments or anything like that mm -hmm. and so i'd say just if you could just keep on reading about the saints and then maybe you know going to the sacraments and stuff and not give up i know things get rough and i know that you know you may not have friends like I don't have any friends and you may not <laughs> you know you may not but you just keep on um, praying to St. Joseph and to Our Lady every every night you say your three Hail Marys and your prayers and your rosary and just keep on praying and asking God for help and um, just uh, remember that those people who are teaching you um, not your parents but the people who are teaching you for example or in the schools, or they're just not telling you the complete truth of the history. They're mm. taking a lot of that, the truth out. So just remember that it may, they may sound convincing, but you can do your research and um, go on your own instinct of doing your own research and finding out the truth. I pray a lot. I have mm -hmm. to say the prayer of St. Andrew and all that. I even say mm. now in the prayer to, uh, I just, Pray to him a lot. I have so many. Just keep on praying. Find any little prayer. It doesn't have to be three pages long. It could just be a little prayer. You mm -hmm. know, like Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. A little prayer mm -hmm. that God will hear you and he'll help you and your family. Just ask for light and guidance. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for allowing me to interview. As I said, it's like the first time that we've met. But oh, I really it's, appreciate it. It's uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it's uh, and there's just so much more to talk about. When I was, you know, in the communist country, there's just so much. But I see so many um, parallels. Everybody just nowadays seems to just want to, you know, want you to go the wrong way now mm -hmm. nowadays. And uh, we need to we need to pray to keep our ourselves and our families. We need to ask God to help us now. And Certainly. Our Lady, it's a it's it's a hard time. So. Certainly. Just hang in there and pray. Yes. And I think your story is going to be very helpful Absolutely. for many people. Well, hopefully. thank you, Father. Well, it's thank you. so nice to be interviewed by you. So that is that is the end of our show today. And something just... Uh, I think the AC just turned off because I stopped listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that was our show today. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as always, you're welcome to send any questions or, or comments on our webpage. That's The Catholic Wire. And you're listening to Back to the Faith. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you for listening to The Catholic Wire. If you have found this show helpful, please say a prayer for all our collaborators. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels and share with your friends. For questions and comments, you may contact us at thecatholicwire.org.